Good morning again. Um, Hisham is being very non-committal about the time he's giving me. He says, I just talk, just talk. You know, yelling. Um, <laughs> so thank you, uh, Adarag. That was a really interesting talk. And, and building on that, um, I'd like to share with you some of some work that we've done, uh, the work that we've been doing over a few years. Uh, so, uh, an introduction again. My name is Nishal Govardhan. I'm an internet analyst at Packet Clearinghouse. Uh, no, we do not sell IP transit. We don't clean or clear your packets either. Um, we're a research organization. We're based uh, in the United States, but for my part, I hardly ever visit Trump land. I mean, the United States. And uh, I, I work out of Johannesburg. Um, most of my work is based around uh, the developing part of the world. So I spend a lot of time in uh, Africa, of course, Southeast Asia. Uh, now that Hisham has joined the NCC, I've been trying to work with him in this region. Um, we do research in a bunch of things, and, and one of the things that we do do is produce papers on things like peering and interconnection, um, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, but I can't take all the credit for this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just the well, you know, attractive guy on stage talking about uh, things that are going on now. The real work was done by two of my colleagues, um, our executive director, Bill Woodcock, um, and the data analyst, Marco, um, from PCH. So I will try to answer their questions, but if you're going to ask me difficult math questions then no. Um, so background to this. About five years ago PCH conducted what we call a really large internet survey. So I'm sorry about the slides, there are lots of text, um, but we try to make it so that you can take it away and read it at your leisure without having to listen to my voice. Um, so yeah, about five years ago we did an internet, we, did, we, we connected an internet survey particularly about peering. And we asked three questions of the different operators that we had reached out to. Um, and the questions are, as they're written up there, is the agreement formalized in a written, in a written document? Um, does the agreement have symmetric terms? And if, there's a, if there is an agreement, of course, what is the country of law governing the what is the country of the governing law of the agreement? So it's a very simple survey. This was done in 2011. And at the time, it was, it was really, really interesting because it was a large survey, the largest of its type. Uh, previous to that, I think the largest survey had been about, what does it say, 16 uh, network operators only, and those were only from the US. So to have, um, to have done analysis of about 142,000 agreements um, from over 4,000 networks uh, five years ago. This was, you know, this was groundbreaking work. And, and you would have heard some of the results come out of it. Uh, sorry, if you're interested, the survey is available there online. Um, and you would have heard some of the results come out of this a little earlier on. Thomas, uh, earlier this morning, mentioned some of the statistics you would have seen out of it. And the paper's been downloaded over half a million times, and it's been used in various forums, including um, the OECD. Uh, so uh, this is a quote from Dr. Sam Paltridge, where he says that the data that was here, basically, was really useful to us at the OECD. And we use this as the basis for saying that the internet peering ecosystem regulates itself pretty well. It's, it's a nice self regulating system within the OECD countries, so we're, we're going to stay off. We're not going to try to manage how the internet and how peering and interconnection works in this part of the world, again, the OECD countries, um, because, well, clearly you're doing the right thing. So um, we think that the, the, the data and the results that come out of this are pretty good, and, well, here's a testament from the OECD saying that they thought that the results were good as well. So it was five years ago. Um, it was a long time in internet terms, and we promised that we would try to repeat the survey every kind of five years so that we'd get some sort of time series data that we could look at over a period of time. And of course, it's uh, 2016, well, last year was 2016. So we issued the same survey again, with the exception of us adding one new question to the survey. And that new question was, are you exchanging IPv6 traffic with this peer? And I think you're all, uh, pretty much aware IPv4 has run out in this region a long, long time ago. IPv6 is the future. Get on board. Uh, speak to the NCC. Now, I'm going to stop at this point and just say that we get, we get lots of requests for folks saying, can't you add the following and the following and the following? And yes, it's great. We can add easily 100 questions to the survey. But then it affects the quality of the data we get. So we try to keep the survey as short as possible because, firstly, if you're like me, you don't like clicking through lots of yes, no answers or anything like that. But also because we want to make sure that the short, concise answers we get typically match from one party, typically match up what the other party is saying. And you'll see this in some of the data that I present to you um, a little later on. So 2016, what have we done? 
Well, from 140 odd thousand um, interconnection agreements in 2011, we've managed to get one point, we've managed to analyze 1.9 three, five, da, 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 million agreements. So the numbers increased. So thank you if you replied to the survey. Um, you, your data is in here somewhere. It's all anonymized. We promise not to release that. Um, and yes, the numbers grown quite nicely. Aside from just the 1,400-odd uh, networks that we managed to reach out to in 2011, this year we managed to, get, uh, last year rather, we managed to get to almost 11,000 networks covering all of the OECD countries. So you can see that they, they have a strong bias towards giving us data because, well, it feeds back into their regulation, right? And um, we also got data this time for the first time from 21 of the UN LDC, the least developed countries. So there's a good spread of data coming from the most developed countries in the world down to what the UN considers the least developed countries in the world. Uh, so that map is, um, is, is cute, but it's also slightly misleading. Um, and I apologize, I didn't do the graphics. You'll have to scream at Bill and Woody, for, uh, Woody and Marco for that. But the map's slightly misleading in the sense that it, it might uh, it, it's not normalized. It's not normalized for the number of interconnections. So you can see we've got a lot of, in, uh, we've got a lot of uh, data coming back from the United States. We've got a lot of data coming back from Russia, um, South Africa, where I'm from. And while it might not seem that there's a lot of data from some of the countries in Central Africa, for example, we, that, that's not necessarily the case. In some areas where there's only one network, we've grouped or we've, we've sort of colored it or shaded it by the number of respondents that we've gotten. So if there's only one network in the country, it might appear not well shaded in here, but in reality we probably have a 100% uh, answer rate in that particular economy. So onto the analysis. So the proportion of representations, um, ah, there we go. This is going to be like yesterday, Hisham. Um, so, uh, so, so what we have here are basic, three basic elements. The red, line, this, the red line is indicative of the answers that we have. So these are the people that answer the surveys. Um, the numbers on the top, the, the tall blue, so to speak, that's the number of registered ASNs in that country. So you could, as you'd imagine, the United States, Russia, the UK, Germany, there are lots and lots of potential AS partners that we could have gotten, uh, uh, potential answers that we could have gotten out of those countries. Um, and the dark blue, and it didn't come out too clearly here, I'm afraid, uh, the, the one a little lower down, those are what we would call transit ASNs. So an AS that's providing IP transit to some other AS either within that country or you know, to a neighboring country or something like that. And what's interesting is you'll see that the line that we've got, the respondents cuts neatly across almost always above um, the transit ASN. So we're getting a lot of respondents that are coming from stub networks. Now this, if, if you've been listening to what's been going on this morning and not hacking away at uh, Facebook, you'd, you'd find that this is pretty much what Paul started saying, that the internet's changed changing. You know, where we, the internet was just internet service providers a long time ago. Now you're getting a lot more sort of edge or stub networks that are coming on board. You heard that from three different people this morning and now there's other data that's showing you pretty much the same thing. Um, and there's more to come. And um, no, it's not clicking. It doesn't move. Uh, one country I want to call out in particular is Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is, and we wrote it down, it's the fourth largest country by population in the world. Uh, it's the 16th largest economy, and it's made tremendous strides in their peering ecosystem. So in terms of our data, um, Indonesia was at number 18 in terms of the number of respondents that we got and the adjacencies we got uh, uh, five years ago. It's, it's moved all the way up to number five. And, and at, when I saw these results, because I don't do too much work in that part of the world, I was amazed. So I went back to look at the uh, exchange point directory that we maintain to look at the Indonesian networks. And it's true. The internet exchange points where I was expecting them to have maybe 100 peers or maybe 150 at max, um, these, these, they have like 800 peers now. So uh, the, something's going very, very well in Indonesia right now. Um, so I'm going to call out Indonesia because you're going to see some of the information. We thought it would be interesting to analyze Indonesia as an economy because of its explosive growth. Um, to the meat of the survey. So of the results that we've gotten, 95,510 of the agreements um, were, were sort of symmetric. They were, you know, the same agreement seen from two different sides. So roughly 477,000 uh, matching pairs. In other words, what I am saying, I am peering, if, if, I, if I claim to have an adjacency to a network on that side, that network is validating that, yes, 
uh, network Nishal has an adjacency to me. So, you know, if you do the math, basically that, that says that there's 98.71% of the data we have has been verified by peers on the other side. So that means that the data that we have is actually pretty solid. Um, it's, it's not somebody making up relationships, for example, right? Um, it's because it's somebody saying, I have these peers, and the peer on the other side validating that these peers are there. Now, in as much as that's a good example, um, uh, sorry, in much as it's good data, 98% of it, it's slightly down from the, the statistics we had five years ago. L five years ago, we had 99.52%, and we attribute a lot of that to the fact that we're adding more questions. So as I said at the start, when you add more questions to the survey, the chances that you're going to get data that matches, that overlaps, starts to get, uh, you know, incrementally lower. Um, and that's why we're very wary of adding additional questions to the survey. Um, so key findings, and what you've been waiting for, Thomas, if, you, if you're at the back. Um, in, 1990, in, in, in 2011, we reported that 99.73% of interconnections happened on a sort of a handshake-ish kind of basis. That's gone up. So it's now 99.98%. So for those of you that are pairing, chances are that 99... Oh, sorry, I missed a slide. Oh, have I? No, I haven't. 99.98% um, uh, of the, the, the peering relationships don't require formal contracts. Um, that's phenomenal, okay? Um, the other thing that was notable about it is that these are also symmetric terms. Now, earlier on, this day, earlier on today, we heard, we heard someone mention the term paid peering, and my ears pricked up for a second, and I was listening to this, this notion of paid peering, because you hear this in the environment. You hear people say, paid peering is a thing, right? Come to me and I will, uh, I can sell you partial transit, or that, that was the term that was given, given out sooner. Um, our statistics say otherwise. Our statistics say that of the networks that are out there, um, the people that are talking about paid peering, or the people that are saying paid peering is a thing, are the people that are trying to sell you paid peering and the people that are getting paid to talk to you about paid peering. So you, you see the conflict of interest here, right? Um, I'm getting reimbursed by the fact that I can talk about paid peering, so I'm always going to talk to you about, well, paid peering being a thing. Because if I don't talk to you about paid peering being a thing, well, I'm not going to earn my salary at the end of the month. So the data that we have indicates that the, the, data, the, the, the relationships between peers are symmetric. No one's really uh, interested too much in uh, you know, I wouldn't say they're too interested. No one's uh, transferring information on a basis where they feel that they've been slighted by anybody else. Uh, there's a strong preference for, sorry, continuing with the survey results, there's a strong preference for the United States, Canada, and Japan remaining as the countries of um, origin for peering. So if we had to ask where, um, where are your... Uh, Where's the country that is governing the relationship of peering? Uh, the countries that have, that, have, that have stayed at the top, the United States, Canada, and Japan, are still there. They're still in uh, spots number one, two, and three. But post Snowden revelations, two countries that have moved up quite nicely are Iceland and Finland. And if you're not familiar, Finland is one of the few countries in the world that has it written down in law that access to the internet will guarantee that access to the internet is guaranteed in law, right? Um, so it's it's you know. If you want internet access, go to Finland based. Unfiltered internet access, go to Finland. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be there for you. Um, on the worst side of the list, so the countries that people uh, don't want to basically transact in, um, that's uh, interesting enough for me. Um, child, uh, Sorry, China and Thailand have joined uh, the countries that were traditionally at the bottom. So the countries at the bottom, Romania, Ukraine, and Russia, you're still there, unfortunately, um, but you've now been joined by uh, China and Thailand in the last two spots. And there should have been, there should have been a graph, but I don't know what happened to it. Perhaps I'll check my notes and, and post them up online. Um, so this is the number of interconnection partners per, here we go. I knew I was missing a slide. So the, this is another key finding. And for me, this was something that was particularly interesting. I mentioned earlier on that I quite all these days. Um, and I remember peering, and I remember setting up peering in Johannesburg, and I remember peering with my partners and, and having to do the hard work, having to go to the microphone, build the relationships, reach out to folks to say, would you like to peer with me? Would you like to peer at our internet exchange point? Here's the value of peering. Now, I still believe in that. And I still think that that's very important and very necessary to build that peering ecosystem. But 
some of the information that we've got out of the peering survey says that most peering that happens today happens from a multi, from on a multilateral peering session. So if you're, if you're not quite certain what that means, it means that at an internet exchange point, for example, you would peer with the, the route server that is at the internet exchange point, and that's it. You'd get the benefit of peering with everybody else simply because they're all peering with the route server. I've always, I've always thought that the route server was simply a nice to have at the exchange point. And five years ago when we did the data, it came out that about 60% of the world's internet, well, we can't measure traffic, right? We, but we do measure the number of, in, we do measure the number of adjacencies or the interconnections. And it seemed that about five years ago, 60% of the adjacencies were based on route servers. Today that number is a staggering, uh, and it's not here, but it's well over 90%. So route servers are in. Okay, everybody, if you're running an exchange point and if you don't have a route server, there's conclusive evidence here that says you're doing your peers a disservice, you should be running a, a route server at your internet exchange point. Um, so, so let's look at some of the data. Um, and you can, see, you can see the spikes, and the spikes typically are indicative of, um, so here we have uh, the number of adjacencies, and sorry, here we have the number of adjacencies, and here we have the number of networks. So um, looking at the Jakarta Internet Exchange Point, you can see that there's about a thousand networks in Jakarta that have, what is that, probably like 80, 80 or 90 odd um, adjacencies. That's made much more clearer here. So there's actually 1,021, I remember the number, 1,021 networks that have exactly, um, well, 102 adjacencies, there, there it is. Uh, the peak just didn't show out nicely there. So these are networks that have exactly one adjacency. In other words, they peer at that exchange point and nowhere else. They don't have any BGP sessions, even to other peers that are necessarily at perhaps a do another domestic exchange point or anything else. So I'm going to go back to what I said earlier on when I said that route servers, this, that's this year's black. It's, it's, it's the thing that's in. Um, so that's the Jakarta exchange point. Uh, so measuring, looking at countries that are benefiting from route servers, so this is, this is also quite interesting. I, I apologize, the slide didn't seem to come out quite nicely here. Um, so we've normalized the peers that are going across like this. And looking at Indonesia, just, just Indonesia, from our data, it seems that there are two uh, multilateral peering um, servers in, in Jakarta. Now that might be incorrect, uh, there might be more than that, um, but as I said, this is based on the data that we have. Um, so we've got that down as two, but look at the number of adjacencies. So here you're looking at about 500 times 500, which is, or rather 1,000 times 1,000, because there's about 1,000 peers there. Um, 1,000 times 1,000, which is a really large number at the top. So even though there's a smaller number of multilateral peering servers, in other words, fewer route servers that are available at the Jakarta exchange point, the number of potential adjacencies that they have is actually higher than, say, a more developed peering environment that we would expect, like Germany, which has a lot more um, route servers and a lot more internet exchange points, simply because the matrix, the thousand by thousand, is much higher than, well, the matrix that you would see in another uh, developed country. Um, so that was interesting for me. Um, I, I, I was very pleased to see South Africa feature up there. Um, I know I said I run three exchange points, and it was interesting for me to see that all our data appears to be um, are correctly added in there. So the good news, the good news was that uh, people are not being fussy about peering. People just want to peer. They're not w worried about how they're peering. They're staying away out of a few countries, um, and they're happy to peer at route servers because of this fire and forget type mentality. You basically set up a BGP session, you walk away, and you know whether it's 50 networks later or 1,000 networks later, you, the adjacencies are magically just adding on to themselves. But not all the data in the uh, survey came out very well, and one of the things that didn't fare very well was IPv6. Um, so of the, the, the results that we have of the respondents, only 3.88% indicated that they were exchanging IPv6 traffic with everybody else. 96.12% of the respondents indicated that there's no IPv6 going on. So, um, and again, this is data that people submitted to us. It's not us uh, trying to extrapolate information from routing tables like you've seen Anurag try to do. This is stuff that we asked the community to provide in input on. Now that's shockingly bad. You know, uh, for 20 years into IPv6 deployment, one would expect to see that IPv6 is doing uh, a lot better than, well, that measure of interconnections. That doesn't mean that there isn't IPv6, it just means that the people that responded to us indicated that they're not doing v6. And, well, as you see, a lot of people did respond to the survey. Of the respondents that we did get, 
interestingly enough, Russia and Brazil had uh, very high IPv6 numbers. So Russia had the highest average at about 21%. So 21% of the respondents indicated that yes, we're doing uh, V6 uh, peering, um, followed by the Ukraine, uh, Brazil, and the United States at 4.7%. And that takes our global average to about 3.8%. So if I look at, if we draw a line here that says this is the global average, Pretty much those are the only countries that are above it. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Brazil, and the United States. Everybody else kind of falls below the world, well, below the world average, which is not good news, I think. Um, and then there's a, a big discrepancy between the networks that are interconnected. So again, talking about IPv6, there's about the so, so sort of the 12th largest networks in the world are saying, yes, no problem, we can, we can do this. We're doing IPv6, and we're doing IPv6 with about, what is it, 70% of their peers. So, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good number. You've got a, a lot, you've got 70%, which is a, a decent enough number, of 12 of the largest respondents that we've had out there. Uh, and these are typically the very large networks in the world saying, yes, yes, we're doing IPv6. But the problem that, we ha that I see the problem that we see, rather, is that the lion's share of the smaller networks, the guys that technically you would expect to be more agile from a network perspective and more able to adopt V6 because they don't have a lot of the problems that the larger networks have, well, they're not telling on V6. So you've got this problem with, again, one sector of the market saying, yes, we've got 70% of it, but by far the lion's share of the, the smaller networks, the guys that should be doing this saying, nope, sorry, we have not got around um, to routing IPv6 yet. Um, so you can see 0.44 IPv6 prefixes uh, and, and only with 0.15%. That's, that's shockingly low, really. Um, so to tie this back into uh, other world statistics, now this is a, a slight misnomer. This is not necessarily an indication that the IPv6 traffic you have is an indication of, uh, so, so, sorry, the number of prefixes that you announce is an indication of the, the traffic that's there. But we thought it would be interesting to go back to the, um, the internet exchange point directory that we have. So this is something that PCH has been running for years now. Um, and, and, and one of the things we've recently added is going to the exchange point operators and saying, how much V6 traffic do you have at your exchange points? So looking at Russia, uh, North America, in this case, the Seattle exchange point, uh, and, and uh, in the Amsterdam exchange point, we could take the numbers that we picked up earlier on. So 21% of Russian networks were saying we're doing IPv6 peering, and roughly 17% of the traffic across the Moscow internet exchange point is um, IPv6. Now, it's a cute coincidence. This is, by, <laughs> this is by no means indicative that it's going to be the same everywhere else in the world. We thought that it was really interesting that the numbers as the peers responded to us pretty much are not that far off, 4.7%. Uh, 4.75% at Seattle, they're pretty close. And it, it was a nice coincidence for us. So can we tie this V6 stuff back into something that, that makes sense to folks? And this is a question regulators like to ask. Is it cheaper for us to do V6? Is it more expensive for us to do V6? So we took the, uh, we took the respondents that replied, mapped them into countries, and tried to map that out to so, sort of earnings, right, GDP. And um, there's nothing in there that makes sense. I mean, you try to find a, try to find a pattern in that, uh, and, and Marco spent a week, if I remember, just trying to, trying to look for something. There's nothing in there that makes sense. Because, for example, you've got Qatar, which is, well, high GDP overall, but very, very low IPv6 uh, deployment. On the other side of the spectrum, complete other side of the spectrum, you've got Gambia and Rwanda, which are two of the poorest countries in Africa, but at least the respondents are telling us that their V6 deployment is, well, over 10%. But it's 12, 15, 20% or so. So there's no indication, at least to us, and from the data that we have, that V6 deployment is tied into any kind of wealth or measure of the network or value of the network or GDP or anything like that. Some countries are doing well. Some economies are not doing well. It is what it is. Um, Ah, yeah, this is, this, is one of my, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures. So this is an indication of the domestic versus international peer, uh, peering arrangements that you might have. Um, and what that means effectively is a country that's colored in nice and dark. So uh, let's, pick, let's pick my country, let's pick South Africa. You can see it's fairly dark. That means that there's 
there's a strong web of interconnections between the domestic providers. The number of domestic to domestic adjacencies is very, very high. And that's a really good thing. So that's indicative of a well-connected domestic internet economy. And that's pretty much what you'd want to see. Okay? Um, and you can see that that features, uh, I'm boastful. I can talk about my country because I've, I know the history and the background to that. But I also know that we spend a lot of time talking to them about peering and getting folks to understand the value of peering and getting, getting them interconnected. And you can see um, even darker than that is the United States, Russia, and uh, Brazil. It didn't come out so clearly in here. And again, those are three economies where there's lots and lots and lots of domestic interconnection. Now, don't mistake that for understanding that there's no international uh, connectivity or there's low international uh, connectivity or international adjacencies. What this simply means is that the number of domestic adjacencies by far outnumbers the number of international adjacencies. Um, and, oh yeah, there we go, pie charts to show you this. So, in, in the US, 23%. Uh, which, is quite, which is quite high. Uh, Germany as well follows up with a quite high number. And um, if, we look at, if we look at the US, so, uh, sorry, if we look at Russia, uh, you can see that 57% of the adjacencies in Russia are domestic adjacencies. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. Uh, in, in Britain, of course, it's 33%, so it's slightly lower. Uh, these are the German numbers. And this, this pretty much matches. I bet if we have to ask the DKIX team for some sort of uh, percentage on you know, where their members are coming from, they'll tell you that a significant component of their membership is not, well, is German, but also non-German as well. And it probably is pretty close to these numbers. Um, and Indonesia, uh, I'll mention Indonesia, you can go back in time and track the number of uh, networks that have been peering using the IXP directory, and, and that's, that's phenomenal. It's grown. As I said, it was 800 peers, and you see that well reflected here. This is the 49% of uh, adjacencies between Indonesian networks happening to other Indonesian networks. So, so that's, that's, that's amazing to watch. It's inspiring, actually. Um, how am I doing on time? He says, stop. So I'm going to go very quickly to the last two slides. Uh, so this is just a little bit more about um, how we see address space being allocated. Uh, so here we've got v, the, the V4 address space. You can see that there's uh, a, lot of folks, a lot of folks that have a lot of address space at the top. I think the next slide has it. So these guys have 133 million IPv4 addresses, these networks, but very, very low number of adjacencies. So those are the incumbents of the world, the very, very large telcos that only want to connect and talk to each other. Okay. Here you would see the thousand odd networks that are having, well, not, not, as, not, as, not, not 133 million, probably about a million or so IPs, but they happily, well, there's a thousand of them odd peering with each other, so that's the Indonesian spike. Um, okay, just a minute. And this is the IPv6 version of the world. Now, we've divided this by 10 to the 24 so that it becomes a lot clearer. And one good thing that this matches the data that Anurag was talking about is that you see the number of prefixes that people are adver ad advertising. And the prefixes here are typically around the, I think it's on this one, the prefixes here are typically around the one prefix. So everybody's advertising their 1 slash 32 or their 1 slash 48. And thankfully, we haven't started the, the de-aggregation wars in V6 yet. Uh, Hisham's again signaling me that I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop there and say thanks very much. And um, I don't know if we have time for questions. Thanks before already up there. So yeah, Jan. If, if your mic doesn't work, it's a sign. No, it's not. Hello, Nishal. My name is Jan Jorge, Internet Society. Um, you mentioned uh, Rwanda, right? Yes. And IPv6. And out of curiosity, does it, does it happen to know? Uh, do you know what's going on there? Why, why the IPv6 uh, deployment is so high there? The, what is, what's going on there? What's happening? So, two things. First, it's not necessarily IPv6 deployment that's high. Uh, in Rwanda. It's the number of respondents that have replied to us indicating that they have peering adjacencies with other networks. So I have a peering relationship with you. Peering relationships may not necessarily be indicative of traffic levels. Okay. okay. Um, I would attribute, though, having been in Rwanda, I was in Rwanda about a month ago. We were doing work with the Internet Exchange Point operators there. Um, and this is something that the Internet Exchange Point operator has taken upon themselves to um, sort of push as an agenda to say, IPv6 is important, you should be doing this. So I know that the, the Richter, who is running the CCTLD and the Exchange Point, is, they're very hands on in the community trying to deliver the message of trying to get people to use IPv6. To my understanding, though, they're 
are some networks that are doing v6. There are not a lot of home networks. Actually, I lie. There is a home network. There is a, a broadband network doing v6 now. It's an FTTH network, and, and they they are now dual stacked completely. Thank you. You're welcome, Jan so, I yeah. think. Please. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. Eric Zegas, Farsight Security. Uh, one of the things you were struggling with was finding a correlation for IPv6 peering versus GDP or some other statistic. One of the things that I saw from your map was that for the most part, most of the world is starting to do v6 peering with the exception on your map of what it seemed to be Africa. And if I understand correctly, Africa is one of the few places where you can still get IPv4 from the RIR. So it's perhaps that they haven't hit Randy Bush's wall yet of urgent need because they haven't run out. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, that's absolutely true. Um, it was only about two weeks ago that Afrinic announced that it's finally hit its last slash eight. So while in Ripeland you've been living in the last slash eight for about five, four and a half years, I guess, um, Afrinic has finally joined the, the exhaustion club. Uh, and, and if you look at the policy, the Afrinic policy mailing list, there's certainly the message that we have IPv4 we have IPv4 for now. Let's worry about V6 problems when we get to it. Um, so that's true. That, that would probably be true for Africa, but it's, it, it doesn't explain, what, for example, why some of the more developed countries, and if we go back, Hisham's hating me right now because I'm taking up more time. Um, if we go back here, so some of the really, really, really uh, rich economies in this region, so Liechtenstein, for example, I mean, is there a good reason, is someone here from Liechtenstein perhaps, say, do you know what's going on, why there's no V6 deployment? And that, that's what we were struggling with, trying to understand that is there a reason why some countries are doing particularly well at it and some people, and, and some countries are not. And we don't have that information yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, okay, Maher Kassam, uh, Data Pro Links, Lebanon. I noticed something very interesting that the least, two of the least popular places to peer in the world or peering points had the highest IPv6 peering uh, adjacencies, which was interesting. Uh, any idea why that happened? Like Russia and Ukraine specifically, they had the highest IPv6 uh, peering adjacencies, but they were the least popular places to peer in the world. Um, so it's not that they're the least popular places. It's 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 not an indictment on where people peer. It's the it's if there is an agreement, where would the uh, sort of the law for that agreement reside? So people aren't comfortable having an agreement that's presided on by a Russian court, a Ukrainian court, or something like that. Okay. Um, and then as to why there's no V6, well, you tell me. I mean, I still have V4 in my home. Do you? Um, Let's, let's talk about things like population, right? Russia's population. I mean, you know this better than I do. They have a large population. Uh, they need to start getting their folks online. How are they going to do it if they don't have V4? And you haven't had V4 for four, four years now? Five years, Hisham? Yeah, I guess. That's so, um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to pretend that I know the answers as to why Russia and the Ukraine are doing so well. I can guess at them. Um, perhaps there's someone here that has a more uh, definitive answer than me. But I can give you my guesses if you'd like. And it's going to come down to well, we need to get people moving to the next level. Um, it, it's the same reason that China is doing V6 right now, right? Because you know, honestly, they can't get V4 anymore. So. Salam. Salam, um, uh, I think I can pr propose uh, why you don't. Uh, this graph, I would do it IPv6 routing versus uh, uh, new networks. And the theory I'd like to propose is that countries that are deploying new networks or where potential for deploying new network is high, then have higher IPv6 penetration. So they're using IPv6 for new network, which is relevant for this region. So when you're deploying new networks, think IPv6 as opposed to like the rich economies like the United States or Liechtenstein, there is no room to grow any more networks and then you don't see any IPv6 deployment. So thank you. And that, that's something that we considered as well. So going back to the poster child for what, we've been what I've been talking about for a lot of this, Indonesia, we thought, well, Indonesia is so well connected now. There's you know, all of these hundreds of thousands of adjacencies that have come up. Let's go and look at their V6 statistics and look where Indonesia features, right at the bottom. So there's no indication. If seems to us there's no correlation between the number of adjacencies you have in V4, the number of adjacencies you have in V6. You could be really well connected but in V4 land, for example, but not so much in V6 land. And there doesn't seem to be any sort of rational explanation for us. But if you've got ideas, and thank you for that, if you've got ideas, we'd love to take that back and perhaps we can 
add uh, um, some more, a more pointed question or two into our next survey. Um, again, we're going to be doing this in five years' time. Um, so if there's something that you think that would be interesting to us or to you, if you're a regulator or policymaker and you think that this data is useful or a network, uh, please come speak to me during one of the breaks. Thank you.